Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us today um, for the Innovate Ag Smart Orchard webinar series. Today, we, uh, my name is Steve Mantle, and today we're really excited to have uh, Farm Cloud and Green Atlas with us today to talk about the Green Atlas Cartographer product. Um, I'll be joined today with Steve Shedding, uh, who is coming to us from this afternoon from Australia, bright and early. And then Adam Zedeker on uh, the eastern side here of the mountains um, will be speaking as well. And he is with Farm Cloud and also a fifth generation farmer. So thank you very much, gentlemen, both of you for being here today. Um, a quick backdrop on, uh, on Innovate Ag, and then we'll delve right on into Farm Cloud and, uh, and Green Atlas. Um, our focus as Innovate Ag is really pulling together data from many different sources for growers and providing a integrated set of data and an integrated view of that data so that a grower, rather than having to look at several different apps, can go to one place and look at how um, all of that data relates to each other with the intent to help you make better decisions on uh, resource utilization and positioning that includes people and equipment, pest management, chem, uh, planning, irrigation, and so on and so forth. Um, and we do so by partnering very closely with land-grant universities, including WSU, um, where they can bring in their disease models, crop management guidance, pest management guidance uh, as well. Our focus is predominantly on permanent crops, which aligns very well with Green Atlas and Farm Clouds focused predominantly on the same. So with that said, uh, I will turn it over to Steve Shedding. Steve, welcome. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll try not to take up uh, too much time, but I, I thought I'd give people a little bit of the Green Atlas story this morning and you know talk about where we've come from and, and what led up to the establishment of the company. So prior to Green Atlas, we'd been doing um, six or seven years of R&D. Um, oh, if you can go back a slide, Steve. Um, and really to answer the question, can you take robotics technologies, computer vision, um, and solve the problem uh, of, uh, you know, can you manage an orchard? Can you image the crop and understand, uh, you know, how those technologies can provide value? So here we're now seeing our original research platform from, uh, you know, from probably eight or nine years ago, which was an autonomous ground robot with every sensor we could think of thrown on it. Um, there's a soil mapping probe at the back of that one. Uh, this is it doing some LIDAR scanning, showing the kinds of information that, uh, that we can build up. In this example, it's imaging and segmenting every single tree, I believe in an almond orchard here. Um, so really this was the, you know, the culmination of, of a lot of robotics research that had gone on before, uh, even the horticulture research. Um, so a lot of these tech technologies and techniques were, were stolen from, uh, from existing things. Uh, this is what it looks like at scale. Uh, this is now a mango orchard. Every single one of those white dots is where we've detected a fruit. Um, so we're looking at you know, how do we do yield estimation in this particular um, image and on a per tree basis. So the other thing that we learned through doing a lot of that R&D is also how to validate the kind of work that we're doing. So lots and lots of field counting was done. In this particular graph, we're looking at, you know, the correlation between what you can find in images versus what people would find, you know, doing hand counts on the ground. But really the advantage of going in and automating the data capture is to say, okay, well, instead of having a couple of hand counts in a couple of places, we can do it absolutely ubiquitously and we can do it everywhere. Um, and really what this graph is showing you that we get very, very good correlation to the hand counts just in those handful of places where, where it has traditionally been done. So the result of all of that research was to basically say, yes, we can, we can solve this problem um, using robotics technologies. 
But then there's a separate question, which is, can you do it economically? Can we do it at a price point that growers are willing to pay and that actually make a, a good business sense? You know, can you build a business model around this kind of technology? And that's really where Green Atlas was born um, roughly two and a half years ago now. So if we can just go to the next slide. So this is, this is kind of what Green Atlas looks like now. We, we have multiple um, systems in, in multiple geographies, in multiple crops. We found it in 2018, uh, really with a view that we wanted to give managers actionable data that they can use to make crop decisions, um, certainly within the season um, and understand what they're going to have at the, at the end of the season. So we redesigned everything from scratch as, as a company. And we went from that robotic system uh, to now it's actually a manually driven system where all of the data processing and capture is done automatically, but it's 300 times faster. Um, what used to take three days with, with a robot is now taking about 15 minutes. Um, so each one of these systems that you can see in, in, the, in the photo uh, are capable of capturing greater than 200 uh, acres per day, <coughs> excuse me, per system. So why are we doing it? <coughs> As I touched on a moment ago, it's really about precision orchard management. Within season, we want to understand, you know, when should we thin, how much should we thin, uh, and, and also understanding now that I've done that thing, well, how well did it work? Um, growth regulation and mapping are obviously key things as, as well. Towards the end of the season, we're really focused on things that are external to the farm. So once you understand what's on the trees um, in terms of what you expect to take to harvest, um, then there is a whole bunch of things that can be optimized once you know exactly how many fruit, what size, you know, how many tons, things that range from how many boxes to how many trucks to how much labor, um, all of those things become a little bit easier the more that you know further ahead of time. So next. So as I mentioned earlier, we're in lots of commodities now. Um, that list is actually quite short. We, we're, we're now in 12 different commodities. Uh, we're in lots of different continents and we're rapidly expanding. Um, and we've scanned uh, commercially around 86,000 acres. So we're one of the very few groups um, that do similar things um, that are actually operating all day, every day commercially in, in many jurisdictions, in many crops. Uh, we track a lot of the phenological stages that growers typically interested in. Um, in kiwi fruit, for example, we've ranged from bud sites all the way through uh, to mature fruit. In other fruits, it's a different selection of things, but really we wanna give growers the most opportunities uh, to understand what the crop is doing, um, you know, how the inputs are expressing themselves on the tree um, and to have the data that they need to actually perform an action, to do something differently based on that data. Um, so now I'm gonna hand across to Adam. Adam's been using the system over the last season in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and he'll give you a view of the data and, and what it's useful for. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for you guys' time. Gonna just start diving in uh, to the slides and, and the pictures. Uh, this right here is the same block uh, with all four data sets that you get from one scan of running the Green Atlas uh, system through. And this scan of 32 acres took one hour uh, for all 32 acres. Uh, in that hour um, of work in the field and then the time it takes to process, we ended up with a, a heat map for fruit count, uh, crop density, uh, also canopy volume, and also uh, I can't see it, let me move this real quick. Canopy height. Uh, this is a non-trellis block and or the uh, trees go above the trellis. And so canopy height has a very meaningful uh, definition here. We have seen at times with as many uh, 
wires as we hang in our current blocks that sometimes canopy height, you need to take a good look at it because the top wire can set the top height uh, very equally across the, the, the blocks. Go ahead, next slide, Steve. This is just another view um, of how we can look at this uh, canopy geometry. And so the arrow is pointing to an individual data point and then that individual data point is being expressed through LIDAR on the right hand side there. And that tree on green is the side that the LIDAR was looking at. And imagine on that triangle of the gray, uh, the obtuse triangle, that middle point is where the LIDAR is located. And so that's what you're looking at. And then th you're seeing rows one, two, three. Three is the actively scanning row. And then four is uh, uh, the, the row behind it. Next slide. We have two different ways uh, to look at this data um, very efficiently. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, so, some of you guys have seen your scans. And this is the Green Atlas viewer. Right now, we're looking at heat map, so a non-calibrated uh, fruit count. And if you look at 151 and 150 uh, down uh, in the middle of the screen, you can take those little tabs and rotate them up and down to change the uh, colors that you see um, and how, how you can start to see zones and or individual populations uh, by moving that. On the right hand side is a map that can be exported uh, into a PDF reader and or a PDF uh, georeferencing uh, application. Uh, one of those would be something like Avenza, and then you can take that and walk around uh, your field. Next slide. We've been asked at times, uh, so can we scan during the day and can we scan during the night? Uh, on the left is the day scan, and six hours later, we did the same exact block. The right scan um, is the night scan, and uh, you can still see that, that line uh, between the left and the right uh, of the block, and the numbers are set the same, so 50 and 151, and you can see there's very, very little difference in the amount of apples detected. Next slide. So then the question is, is, so can you take pictures into the sun? Uh, if there's variance in the block, can you see that? And so these next four slides are gonna be quick snapshots on what that, those look like as you enter into the high resolution side. And on the right hand side, that's just uh, the cartographer set up to take pictures of grapes. So every square that you see here, and these are Fuji's uh, right before harvest. So red kind of blends in to the flesh color, um, but every square is an apple counted. Uh, next slide. Here, this is a night slide. The one before was a day slide. You can see how the machine is doing a great job of getting images of and capturing numbers of the Fuji's. But as you look over to the right hand side, that's a Manchurian crab apple. And you can also see that during the night, it's still picking up those Manchurian crabs that were approximately 20 millimeters at that time. And this machine was being driven at 25 miles per hour. Uh, it was a pretty chilly night. Next slide. Uh, just another great picture of emphasizing on doesn't matter if there's a pollinator there or uh, just the, the crop that we're counting. I like this one because it seemed to really be able to see the red squares compared to some of the other ones, the red squares were blending into the background. Next slide. Uh, this is a random fluke tree in this block. All those other ones had pretty high image numbers, uh, somewhere around 125 uh, on average. 
uh, this is a picture. Uh, we can see the trees are much smaller at this location and the total of images detected is 48. And so it can very easily go from a high number to a low number detection if that's how variable your block is. Uh, what we're looking at here um, is some offerings uh, as well. So we are looking at uh, canopy volume. And on the left-hand side, uh, you can see that green color uh, and you can see the canopy volume expressed in meters. And on the right-hand side, you can see that same exact block uh, with the same numbers expressed with a lot more yellow. On the left side, it was pre-summer pruning. And then on the right side, you can see the rate of change. And you can also see how this grower's individual's rules really made the block much more homogeneous than what it was before it was summer pruned. Next slide. Uh, as Steve was talking, um, up and coming crops in the Pacific Northwest are coming. Uh, this is a picture of pears before uh, the model was reset for pears. And you can see this, this machine, even before it got reset, really does a great job of picking out objects uh, that it can see. Um, and now this, this model has been, has, is in the process and being vetted in South America at the moment. So we're getting every hemisphere's worth of time to try and make these models uh, more accurate and better. Next slide. This is a picture of Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. Uh, you can see uh, it can detect as we move the cameras closer to the canopy, it can detect very small uh, images. And every one of those squares that you see, the Green Atlas cartographer is counting every berry that has a square around it. Uh, I believe the frame, not this one specifically, but the most images ever captured in a frame on our data sets is 1,027 uh, squares or 1,027 uh, berries of Cabernet Sauvignon in a single frame of high res. Next picture. This is that same uh, Cabernet Sauvignon block uh, being shown on the Green Atlas viewer. Uh, everything in dark blue is above 666 objects and everything in yellow is below 309 objects being seen. And you can see the middle of this block really starts to define a nice zone. So if you go where the longest rows are, that's some of the highest production in this block. And you can see the edges uh, of this block um, are not having the same uh, crop load density. Next slide. This is another grape block. I uh, just wanted to show the difference uh, between a zone map being created uh, in the top left-hand corner and then a uh, individual every data point map, uh, a geo PDF in the bottom right-hand corner. And both of these are very valuable. It depends on what application you're looking, you know, looking for. Uh, and zones can be created larger or smaller depending on what uh, the end result or the data, how the data is going to be used. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of counting uh, fruitlets. Uh, right here, uh, I don't know the exact size. This is from our South Southern Hemisphere uh, collaborators. Uh, about 16 millimeters is when we can start doing fruit lick counts on, on uh, apples. And if there's less obscuration, we can count even smaller items. It, it does depend a little bit from crop to crop. Next slide. Uh, this is a, these next two slides will be pre and post thinning. And so this is the pre thinning slide right here. Uh, Everything that's in yellow is below 30 objects seen, and then everything in the dark blue 
uh, is over 129. So this is a pretty uniform block. But this is also a high density block. And so that's still quite a bit of variation from tree to tree. Uh, take a mental picture of how much dark blue you're seeing here. And then Steve, can you flip back? And then this is the same exact setting on the right hand side, 30 and 129. And you can see that the thinning crew really did a good job here of attacking the trees that had lots of apples. Yeah, go ahead and do that a couple more times, uh, Steve Mantle. And the other, the other way to look at this information is on the left-hand side there, you can see there's kind of a triangle across, across the uh, northwest corner, if you're looking at your screen, and north is the top of your screen. Um, that's an area where possibly you could just have guys uh, walk through very quickly and not put your resources of labor into that area and potentially not over thin that area by having thinners walk through there. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to take this. Uh, this is a great application of looking at a whole orchard or paddock, as they would say. Uh, in Australia. And this is, um, we're looking at a geo PDF map that I'll let Steve Shedding uh, take over from here. Sure, no problem. Thanks, Adam. Um, so what we're looking at here is another use case that um, uh, interestingly came to us where uh, a very, in fact, Australia's largest almond grower um, has a problem with mummified nuts, which is nuts left on the trees um, post-harvest where I think in the worst years they've had a pest problem that's that's damaged up to about 10 percent of the crop so it's a it's a multi-million dollar problem and what they've commissioned us to do is to rapidly scan um, all of their hectares and in um, uh, June last year we scanned uh, 15,000 hectares which might be around 35,000 acres off the top of my head um, and what we produced for them were these, uh, these PDF maps um, of locations of what they call mummy pressure. So you can see that little scale down the bottom right that, um, you know, 50 plus nuts uh, per tree was going to be a high pressure. Um, 20 to 50 is a medium pressure and green is, is low pressure. Um, and what the grower did is they, they would load these PDFs up on their phone or a, a tablet and literally a, a shift boss would go into, into the area and they would use these maps to provide instructions to, to crews. Um, you can see in the middle of this block, um, or at least I can see that there, there's a pollinator issue every, every sixth row I can see in the middle there. Um, so they might say to the crew, only do the pollinators here. And then in areas where there are red, um, often they would be correlated to geographic features so they could tell the crews, um, you know, just walk down into the gully. Once you get into the gully, that's when I want you to start knocking the, the nuts off the trees. Um, just by providing them with these geo-registered PDF maps, uh, they told us they were saving about 70 to 80% of their, their labor um, by doing that. So fairly simple application of the technology in terms of, you know, in this case, it is just a map but it's a map that provides, you know, a direct actionable use case for, for this particular grower. Um, so we'll just go to the next slide. So hopefully that gives people a good summary of, of Green Atlas, what we've been doing. And um, I think all of the examples that, that Adam showed are from the Pacific Northwest, except for one, which I think was from, from Australia uh, on the, at Fruitlet stage. So in terms of Green Atlas, um, you know, we, we are continuing to grow, which is absolutely fantastic. We've, we've actually had two orders in, in the last two days, which is, which is brilliant. One in, in Europe, uh, one out of South America. Um, the one in South America is a repeat order. It's a, it's a partner business that actually wants to, wants to expand based on, on the success they've, they've had to date. Um, you know, so we're, we're very happy that, that 
people, you know, by and large, they, they absolutely uh, engage with what we're doing and, and see value in it. So the other thing that we're continuing to do is, is more feature development. So more phenological stages, more crops, really so you end up with more use cases out of the same piece of equipment, which gives everybody a faster payback on, on the spend. Um, so that, that's really in a nutshell, what's, what's next from us and, and what you can look out for. So at this point, I think I'm gonna hand back uh, probably to Steve Mantle to, to talk yeah. about the, you know, the call to action. What's, what's next in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, and Adam, feel free to jump in here as well. But uh, effectively, as, as we move forward this year, um, there are a number, some of the growers are on here where Farm Cloud, um, as the, the North America distributor for, uh, for Green Atlas, ran through um, your orchard or vineyard. Um, and the feedback that we've had from growers overall has been resoundingly positive. Um, and we'd love to follow up with you to, to talk more in detail. Now, there are a couple of options as you consider uh, the Green Atlas capability for this next growing season. First is uh, you can lease the system, the cartographer um, that, um, that you saw earlier. Second is if you're not willing to or not quite ready to jump in with both feet, is a service can be provided by local delivery partners um, through reservation. And so both Farm Cloud and Innovate Ag uh, will have systems available where you can effectively end up with a reservation um, for a system to be delivered and be available for the amount of time that you reserve for here in the Pacific Northwest, predominantly in, in Washington and Oregon. Now there is gonna be limited capacity on that, so I would strongly urge you as we're ordering systems for this next year um, to get in touch with us over the next couple of weeks. We can talk more in depth and then build you into our planning when it comes to availability of equipment and services. The next piece is really the, the managed services for data processing and distribution. So it's obviously not just about the equipment, the cartographer, it's the work behind the scenes that goes into processing uh, the data. And that effectively are referring to as, as cartographer foundational services, which Farm Cloud provides for all growers, regardless of whether you're doing option one or option two. And you saw some of the shots, uh, screenshots of what that ultimately ends up looking like. And you can access that on a web browser, on a standalone app. Um, on your uh, PC or on, uh, on your mobile or tablet type device. And as Adam mentioned, you can do that on the go. That's the great thing about tying it into a PDF and using something like an Avenza Maps uh, application. You can literally see, even if you don't have mobile service, where you are as you're walking throughout uh, your, uh, your acreage. And then Innovate Ag is really uh, as I'll talk about on the Smart Orchard project here in a moment, we're about integrating the data in um, with your labor and your chem and your sensor data. So where you're going to infer from the cartographer foundational services what the implications are for your labor and, uh, and what you do with it, we take it one step further where we can start to tie in your actual data from say your labor management system, your chem records, uh, your sensor uh, data, overlay it all into together to help you make um, even more sense of, uh, of the records. Adam, is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? Uh, at this point, no. Um, I, th I think one of the things that we've seen uh, is every farmer kind of has a different way they want to look at this data and uh, talking that over and then coming up with a set of rules on how your operation wants to look at this data or what what legends your operation wants to use um, really helps start a, a more efficient turnaround. Uh, we would like this to be as efficient as possible. Our goal is to once once the disk is, is given uh, to one of these service providers on um, is to get the information back out 
to the farmers within 48 hours of that. Uh, and that's, that's, that's where we are. Uh, and having that stuff pre-lined out on legends is just going to get that information uh, back, back to the end user uh, sooner. And to, you know, further to Adam's point, um, you know, there's always a, all right, let's wait, let's see what other growers have. But I believe part of the value here, and Steve Shedding can add on here as well, is being able to look at the time series data, both within the season, and then as I think almost every grower can attest to, year over year is often what you're comparing to, right? And so I would strongly encourage you to you know, make the decision now, this, this season, even if it is to stick the toe in the water with option two and, and uh, do some, some, uh, some of your acreage so that you have something to start being able to compare year over year, and you'll even see more value um, going from year to year. You know, Steve, you, you brought something up there. And yeah. I think one of the things I've, I thought I did in a couple of those blocks was the left side or the west side was very uniform compared, you know, within that sub block. And then the east side on that Fuji block, I thought was very uniform. And then we start looking at the data and uh, it's not as uniform as I would like that to be uh you know almost 99 percent of those fuji trees have two liters it's been mechanically hedged uh since the beginning of time um it's cropped according to the csb of the trunk size and we still have that amount of variation uh and so we've put it in some blocks that guys think are very uniform and we're starting to find out there's more variability than i think us horticulturists or at least me as a horticulturist would like to uh uh wrestle with um and with that now i can start making decisions on that yep that's that's a great question and and that's the other interesting thing too is, is you talk to i found was uh dennis or adam would say to a grower uh, last season, hey, why don't you take this to one of your most uniform blocks? And um, almost always the, the grower was surprised. I don't know if it was pleasantly surprised, but surprised at basically the lack of uniformity, um, even on their most uniform uh, location. So um, good points. Um, definitely, we've got some time for Q&A. Um, I am going to slow, let me um, walk through two or three slides, but I would encourage you to um, put your questions into the Q&A slide and we'll open it up uh, for discussion here in a moment. I wanted to briefly just summarize uh, the Smart Orchard pilot that we did this last growing season with WSU and with the Tree Fruit Research Commission. And we're expanding this year to include a second uh, Smart Orchard location, most likely out in Prosser area. Um, and so quick overview of what the Smart Orchard project is. It's basically pulling in data from not just many sensors. Um, here you see a number of different sensors uh, from different providers. And so this is kind of one of the differentiators rather than it be from just one provider that has different sensors where you're, you're stuck with going with them. Our goal is really to pull in data from you know, meter group from Davis Instruments, from Phytech, AquaSpy, um, Tuctronics, Agrinet, uh, Terralytic. So that again, rather than having to go to several different apps, you can start to look at that in a consolidated way. And then two, you have your data all in one place. And so that um, where we're working toward is being able to show the data from whether it be weather-based data on nanoclimate or microclimate, or soil moisture distribution and how that looks, layering that on as additional layers, uh, basically on top of the foundation, which we see a, a critical foundation component being the green atlas data, which was shared earlier by, by Adam. And so our focus really is on uh, commercially capturing and visualizing real-time historical data for growers from weather, from soil moisture and soil nutrient data, irrigation data, and imagery data from satellite, from drone, uh, and from ATV um, based on what where your interest is. And so our, 
our base offering is the Apple and Bloom count tied into Green Atlas. We have an enhanced offering, which is basically pulling it into a dashboard using Power BI, using uh, focused on use cases like irrigation planning. And then the premium capability is really starting to put that data to work. For instance, where you may do um, some smart irrigation, for instance, where you can actually actuate the schedules for your irrigation based on uh, some of what's coming in. We do have an app available on Android and iOS that starts to, that pulls all of that together. Um, and then this bottom section really is just showing uh, again about how all that data uh, converges with the intent to empower the grower and put the grower first um, and, and enable you to make better, more streamlined decisions. So um, I'll leave it on this slide as we switch to Q&A. And um, so let's, let's tee that up. Um, one, um, Prashant had a question, um, is whether this technology is able to identify spectral changes in vineyards and orchards for change in nutritional content, change in water movement, and presence of small insects, and so on. Um, Adam or Steve, do you want to first respond to that, and then I can complement the answer? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um... So actually, one of the things I should have mentioned at the beginning of the of the uh, webinar is that the system is predominantly camera based and lidar based. So we use both technologies. Uh, we're not using hyperspectral sensing in the way um, that you might, for for example, from a satellite or from a drone. Um, and one of the reasons that that's the case is because we want to go fast through the orchard. We want to deliver you um, a service that's that's accurate, but also you know fast. We're we're in and out very quickly. Um, and hyperspectral was not going to to give us that. And really, the 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 difference, certainly in in imaging fruit and flowers um, and those sorts of things, is is very very minimal. Um, having said that. Uh, you know, in terms of imaging, the kinds of things that are in that that question, that's not something that we've actively looked at. However, I'll get Steve to jump in because I suspect he has looked at that as part of Innovate. Yeah, um, that's very much where we can pull in um, the the soil moisture data, for instance, uh, pest trap uh, information that uh, that you may have in terms of uh, pest logs. Um, weather station data uh, where you can look at uh, ultimately the models to tie it into WSU uh, based on GDD. Um, and so that's really our focus is to pull all that in uh, together and complement that fundamental view of the data on the map uh, that you have from Green Atlas. Um, great question. Um, another question from Garrett LaPierre. How well does the yield assessment scan work in more traditional apple plantings? Has it been attempted and ultimately, how does that pan out? Yeah, so I'm, I'll jump in on that one. Um, you know, so one of, the, one of the questions we get in yield assessment is people say, how accurate is it, right? That's, that's question number one. And the answer is always, um, there, is, there is no single answer to that question. It, it depends on a whole host of factors. Um, having said that, we have absolutely done everything from formal 2D trellises um, all the way through to, you know, the big bushy apple trees, three-dimensional, and the system works on all of them, or it can be made to work um, pretty effectively. What, as a rule of thumb, um, I would say that the more formal the system is, the more accurate uh, we're going to get, and that's a function of you know, how much of the fruit is actually visible to the system. But we still get pretty good accuracies, even on the big 3D trees. So, you know, you'd be looking at, um, you know, less than 10% error pretty much every single time. It would be unusual um, to, to do worse than that. As you get to 2D systems, uh, we're often accurate to the bin when, when you're actually uh, doing harvest. So it's, it's a range of accuracies. Um, pruning plays into it. Uh, the tree structure plays into it. Right now, over the last season, we've really been gathering that data to say, on average, you know, how, how well is it going to work? 
but certainly you can expect um, pretty good results, uh, you know, if not perfect, uh, really with any any tree structure. Um, you know, we've done cherries on, on uh, in fact, lots of cherries on 3D trees, apples on 3D trees. Um, we're just starting just starting now to do um, some nuts on, on very large 3D trees. Uh, my only thing I would uh, uh, take on to that is good information in is good information out. And so if you aren't taking the time to take your calibration process seriously and those accounts aren't right, that adds a level of error that uh, can't be taken out of the model. So. Um. Couple, couple more questions. One is uh, from Matt. Um, we do a lot of field trials with different crops, apples, almonds, cherries. This is done by hand, counting by tree and by side, and accuracy is really important to us. If the charting is done at a slower speed, does the accuracy increase? The, uh, the short answer is, is no. Um, we, we tend to get the same error rates no matter what speed we go at. And that's largely because we put in an enormous amount of engineering effort into being able to go fast. So all of the pictures that Adam showed you in high res are, are actually very low res versions of the high res images. And what you can see is in almonds, for example, we drive up to 50 kilometers an hour. Not sure the conversion is 1.6 into, into miles per hour. Um, and we get absolutely sharp images, um, even driving at, at that speed. So a lot of it has got to do with how much fruit is hidden to the cameras. Um, it's not, um, you know, how well can we image what's on the tree. Uh, that, that Fuji block of those night high time uh, images, uh, I didn't go faster. Um, because uh, it was cold uh, and uh, 10 foot rows in the middle of the night um, going above 20 miles per hour uh, makes you think a couple times. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, those, those high res images were taken at, at, full, at, at a good clip uh, and I found it, it's, they've, they've been very reliable. Didn't matter if we were going five miles per hour or 20 miles per hour. Um, and that's actually what I love about the system, right? You guys have honed it so well. Um, and, and that's the neat thing is you zoom in on those photos. It's, it's amazing how crisp uh, those are, um, even going at 25 miles per hour. Um, question from Herman, do we have any data indicating photosynthetic activity and efficiency? Huh. So now, now we're getting into back, I guess, back into R&D, we, we have a little bit of data, um, you know, so we, we work with a couple of um, research orchards, um, both here and, and in Europe. Uh, we have some data looking at um, uh, particularly the, the average temperature of canopies. So where we're relating that to the, to the plant respiration um, a little bit of work as well, looking at CO2, um, where the idea is that if the plant is, uh, you know, working efficiently, that you'll have lower CO2. I'm going to say that the jury is out on both of those things, um, but we do certainly have the capability to, to add those sensors to our system. So it's one of those, you know, watch this space. Um, and, uh, you know, and we may have some exciting uh, updates really really depends on how the validation goes yeah and I, I think we'll definitely learn more as we pull together sensor data um, together and compare notes with with, uh, with the crew on this call um, Bailey on our team had a good point on um, just reminding the the need to take images through critical times in the year other than just one time so um, Adam, could you speak to, and Steve, how, what is the frequency um, and kind of what stages are, is a grower going to see the most impact for them? Well, I think that gets back to what the grower is looking for to start with. 
Uh, in general, though, I could see four anywhere from three to five scans being very effective. I think four scans will give you a very represent good representation of what that uh, acre or hectare or tree is doing. Uh, one at the flower cluster bud stage, if you're looking for uh, flower density or bud density of, of flowers, uh, the next one would be at fruitlet stage, pre-thinning, uh, making sure you can start to prioritize which blocks need more thinning uh, than others. The next one would be uh, pre-post thinning, pre-summer uh, pruning potentially, or more at that inch and a half uh, stage to make sure that your validate that your thinning came out well. And then one about three to four weeks before harvest. And that, that will give you your best yield estimation uh, point. And I think those first three, uh, the heat maps are very, very, um, can service 99% of the uh, ideas or the information you want. And then that estimation one, you really want to make sure uh, you do a calibrated uh, uh, data set on that so you, we can get you down to how many bins per acre. Uh, Steve, if, if you have anything to add there, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. On, and that's in apples and pears. Uh, I even think there's a potential of post-harvest uh, if you have a block that has more issues. So, yeah, I think those things are true. Post-harvest, post we, we're starting to see some interest in um, uh, essentially canopy management around pruning in, in particular. Um, obviously, in, in nuts, there's also the, um, you know, the mummified nuts. as uh, So sanitation uh, kind of issues post-harvest. The, the other one that we get, um, interestingly, in markets, Western markets where the labor costs are higher than in the US, so pretty much everywhere else, there's a lot of interest in flowers around chemical thinning. Um, and so we're, we're actively engaged with a number of uh, spray companies and also um, companies that do Darwin thinning to try to take our maps and then to automatically modulate either sprays or, or Darwin thinners. So we haven't seen as much demand for that in, in the US, but in our other markets, there's, you know, that's, that's probably number one or um, fruitless, uh, you know, they sort of oscillate between one and two. Super. Uh, last couple questions. Um, one is, it was a bit of a variation on the last, which is, uh, have growers used crop load measurements and canopy size as a way to evaluate post-harvest risks, such as bitter pit? Uh, I think it depends on where you keep the apples, but uh, if you kept the bitter pit apples on the tree uh, and you did it immediately post-harvest, there could be a strong correlation of... Uh, finding some of those zones uh, potentially there. Uh, I think there's other, other ways to potentially look at that. I think that's where Steve Mantle said, make sure you start this year, because as you're gonna start building this information, you wanna make sure you have some longevity behind it before you start making on um, potentially some big, big uh, uh, management decisions on a block. Yep, great, great point. And I think again, all the more as we're on the innovate side, bringing together uh, your know, water application data on irrigation, for instance, um, we believe we'll start to see a, a good correlation in there as well. Uh, last, uh, last question or two. Actually, Karen popped in. We've got to make sure Karen gets in here. But uh, one for Steve. Um, have we looked in the autonomous ATVs, uh, you may know a little bit about this, from Honda and so on to perform the data collection. What does that look like today and in the future? Yeah, the, the short answer is, is yes, we've looked at that. Um, and in fact, everyone in Green Atlas in, in the core team, our background is in automation of ground vehicles. And so in a way, you know, it's killing us to, to not have that as part of our initial core product. Um, but actually what we found is that because we wanted to cover ground quickly and we wanted to do it at low cost, it meant making the system 
um, that we feel very simple to use and not requiring an expert to operate it. So the cartographer is a, is a single button press operation. Um, even the data processing is, is automatic. And so really the only thing we haven't automated is, is driving and that's, that's it, right? So it's, it's pretty simple and you can use, you can use cheap labor. So we absolutely see a point in time where either the labor force is squeezed so much or the labor costs become so high compared to the, you know, the autonomous platform that that will change, right? So at the moment, it is absolutely cheaper to do this with somebody driving. Um, maybe five years from now, that will have switched to an autonomous platform, but we don't think that's right now. Typically the platforms have to come with an expert. Um, if some, They're also typically much, much slower than we can manage. So hectares per hour is, is a major factor in, in that decision as well. So the short answer is yes, and we'd love to do it. The longer answer is we, we think it's a little bit further off before it's commercially practical. Yeah, and the context too on, on Steve and team over there as well is there's definitely expertise in-house on autonomous systems, right? So um, I think it's quite telling that you're saying it's, it's not quite there yet um, to, to really be able to get there. Good. Well, uh, I think the last comment really was from Karen Lewis to, to you, Steve, and uh, having access to real-time data will lead to greater adoption of Darwin and Bandit mechanical thinners um, here in the U.S. And um, coming from Karen, who leads the WSU extension slash field offices, um, that's really valuable insights. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that, Steve. All, right. all, all I can say is that it's coming. Um, one of the things we've actually been disappointed by in the, you know, in the spray and the thinning space is that, you know, I'm probably speaking out of turn a little bit, but the technology in terms of spray control, uh, you, if you want to do every nozzle uh, differently and you want to do it at variable rate and you want to change those rates tree by tree, that technology has been a lot slower to evolve than the front end, which is what do I have? Um, and so, you know, our, our approach is really to hedge our bets and we're talking to absolutely everybody we possibly can because we want something to come to market as soon as it possibly can. So I, I completely agree that, you know, tying the two things together is, is a game changer. The, the one other thing that I would just sort of mention is that, there are systems out there that are real time and, and they're typically looking for things like, you know, there is a tree, there isn't a tree and, and there are massive savings that you, um, that you get from that. We're trying to take a bit, of, a bit more of a nuanced approach where it really would be a tree by tree um, variable rate spray, spray the bottom differently from the top, possibly three or four zones up and down the tree vertically. That's, that's really the, the ambition. Um, and that's the bit that's lacking. So I, I just want to be very clear. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not, you know, talking down other, you know, very good products that that are in the market. The the other thing I would add is I use the real time, more of a real time data collection uh, version like this, and I think it was uh, close to uh, forty times slower uh, than what Green Atlas is, and you just you can barely cover about twenty acres, you know, a day. Whereas with Green Atlas, you can cover, you know, 200 acres a day. Uh, so there's there's a point there on that keeping stuff local on a local disk uh, allows you to get across more acreage and get that real, not real time data, but data for more acres. That's great. Well, I at again point everyone ahead to additional webinars that we have, including uh, next week, same time, same place. Um, we'll be joined by uh, the founding team from Smart Guided Systems um, on their variable rate sprayer, which actually ties in well to Steve's earlier point, uh, which also uses LIDAR and literally controls individually uh, 30 or so nozzles on the back of your, your power blast sprayer. Um, so come join us for that. Do reach out to us uh, as well, and um, either on the farm cloud or innovate side, 
We would love to roll our sleeves up with you on questions. And again, as we roll into 2021, um, we're not going to have unlimited systems. So um, getting in and, uh, and placing a reservation and having that discussion, uh, I would strongly encourage you to do sooner rather than later. So uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add, Steve or Adam, in closing that comes to mind? Uh, I would just say it's not just cartographers that are tight right now. I've heard of other uh, UTVs and ATVs uh, being tight uh, in the market. Um, so if you're looking for a Honda Pioneer or a Polaris Ace or a Honda Rancher, et cetera, for your operation, make sure you contact uh, your local dealers now um, to reserve a spot there too. Yeah, it's, it's tight. Um, Adam and uh, Dennis and I know. <laughs> we've been scouring not just all over the country basically to, to find these uh, to lock them in for the year they and uh, particular particularly when it comes to blossom if you you want to catch um, the imaging early on in the season uh, so need to move now well that's a wrap great conversation thank you so much everybody for joining us this afternoon and, and evening Encourage uh, folk to come back and watch this on demand. We will have this available later tonight. And again, we're available for one-on-one -on -one follow ons and deep dives over the coming weeks. Really appreciate your time and have a good evening. There we go. So we've, 